I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, they attack the wrong generation. Families demanding justice in San Diego for 43 students missing in Mexico. On the picket lines in San Marcos, the popular kids' education program caught up in a debate over money and health coverage. And former California Supreme Court Justice Cruz Reynoso talks about Cesar Chavez and the role of today's Latinos in a changing America. I'm Peggy Pico with our conversation and San Diego's homeless will get a new permanent shelter. Mayor Kevin Faulkner joins us with an update on the next steps and other city business. No. Yes. Yes. So yes, my job, making these choices can be tough, but there are plenty of people who have much tougher jobs than me. Class in session for a San Diego councilman. His lessons on winning and losing outside of the classroom. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Hundreds of people marched today from San Diego City College to the Federal Building downtown to raise awareness about 43 Mexican college students who disappeared last year. They were led by parents of some of the missing and by a student who escaped. KPBS Fronteras reporter Jean Guerrero has the latest. So I'm standing here in front of the federal building where about, it looks like about 200 people have marched from San Diego City College, chanting, holding up signs. A lot of them have been repeating, um, counting up to, to 43, um, representing the 43 missing students. Um, they're here, basically they want to ask the U.S. for help um, because they don't trust the Mexican government's investigation into the tra tragedy. I talked to the mother of one of the missing students earlier today and she thinks her son may still be alive. She told me a little bit about why she's here. We don't trust the Mexican government. We don't trust them because they took our children. There's evidence. Also, they've told us nothing but lies. That's why we don't trust them. I also talked to Angel Neri, who's one of the students who escaped the night that the 43 students were kidnapped. He told me that he saw his classmates being shot at, and he's very frustrated with the way the Mexican government has handled the tragedy. And he also talked to me about why he's here. What we're asking for principally is for this country, considered the most powerful in the world, to put pressure on our government to solve the case. He, he told me he remembers seeing one of his classmates being shot at the head by local police. So he's very, very frustrated. Uh, looks like the protesters who are behind me are going to be here for a while. Then they're going to be holding a vigil at 6 p.m. And uh, then they're going to be heading to North County tomorrow and continuing on up the coast as part of an effort to visit 45 U.S. cities to spread awareness about this tragedy. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. The number of cabs allowed on San Diego roadways is set to go from nearly 1,000 to an unlimited number on April 1st, but a coalition of cab owners is trying to stop that. It's filed a lawsuit over the city's move to open the taxi market. The owners say the city should have done an environmental review before allowing more cabs on the road, and they say the city unconstitutionally drained the value of their permits. Many bought them on a secondary market for tens of thousands of dollars. We stand by the program. Uh, I genuinely believe that it's time to give these drivers, these lease drivers, an opportunity to be their own boss, uh, to be able to make a living uh, by keeping that lease money in their pocket. Councilwoman Marty Emerald led the effort to open the market after a San Diego state study found many drivers who leased their cabs from permit owners earn less money than minimum wage. There's a guilty verdict tonight in the massive Cocos fire. A teenage girl from San Marcos was convicted of multiple arson charges. The wildfire sparked last May in the North County, charred 2,000 acres and destroyed more than 30 homes. 
Fire investigators say an ember from a fire set behind the girl's home traveled less than a tenth of a mile to spark the Cocos fire. Today, the judge ruled the teen acted willfully and maliciously in setting the fires. Officials say the cost of extinguishing the fire at nearly $28 million. We will find out what happens to the girl when she returns to juvenile court on April 15th. About 200 Mac Head Start employees took to the picket lines today over stalled contract negotiations. KPBS reporter Matt Bowler has the latest from San Marcos. MAC, which stands for Metropolitan Area Advisory Committee, is a nonprofit most popular for running the Head Start Early Childhood Education Program. Employees and management have been in contract negotiations for over a year and are at loggerheads over the cost of medical insurance. <laughs> Union members say management raises insurance costs many will not be able to afford it. Adela Martinez represents the San Diego MAC union members. She says MAC management is not negotiating fairly. Again, I only hope that I can continue to work for MAC as a proud MAC employee and as a proud union employee, that they come and bargain a fair contract with us. Arnulfo Manriquez has been president and CEO of MAC for about three years now. He says MAC offers a good benefits package and the strike is really just longtime employees fighting organizational evolution. And then when you look at the people that have been here for the longer time, you know, that's where the challenge becomes and, and where they're, they're the resistance to change occurs. They're great employees. MAC is a 50-year-old organization, and is, this is the first time they've had this kind of labor problem. Both parties will be back at the table tomorrow morning. From San Marcos, Matt Bowler, KPBS News. Right now, San Diego City Council is considering a proposal for a permanent homeless shelter downtown. KPBS Metro reporter Taryn Mento joins us from the newsroom with the details. Right now, the city operates two temporary winter shelters. These are basically tents that pop, in, pop up in Barrio Logan and the Midway District in November and then close in April. The plan is to eliminate those tents and house people at a permanent facility currently operated by the nonprofit St. Vincent de Paul Village. The organization currently runs a transitional housing shelter at that site but lost its federal funding for that. The permanent shelter would repurpose the facility. Some speakers told the city council they were concerned the temporary shelter would close before the permanent one would be fully up and running. But St. Vincent's CEO says the change would free up funds to go toward the organization's other housing programs. Taryn Mento, KPBS News. San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner joins Peggy Pico now for our monthly update on the business of the city. San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner, welcome back. Hey, great to be back. Thank you. Now, the Chargers and other backers for a new stadium up in Carson say that they have gathered at least 14,000 signatures, if not more, to put the project on a ballot. Are you still in direct talks with the Chargers and uh, about this new stadium? Yeah, and, and while I can't, can't control what's going on in Los Angeles, uh, certainly all of our efforts is controlling our own destiny here in San Diego. And you know, a lot of positive momentum that continues to build, and rightfully so. You know, my commitment is that we have a, a real plan at a real site, and most importantly, a, a financing mechanism that works for San Diegans, one that voters will support, and keeps the chargers right here in San Diego where they belong. Uh, I, I was talking to Mark Fabiani uh, last week. Is the downtown location still on the table? You know, the, the committee, as you know, has recommended Mission Valley. I think that makes sense for a host of reasons, uh, not only from transportation standpoint, the trolley, freeways, but but really when you start to imagine the possibilities, for example, of opening it up to the river park and, and creating a, a very special place and environment, I think there's a lot of excitement that's building out in San Diego for that. Um, a lot of work still to do, obviously, but, but I'm interested in success. I'm confident that we can achieve that when we work together, um, just as we did when San Diego came together for Petco Park some years ago. Well, speaking of working together, yesterday the City Council approved a five-year, $92 million yeah. contract for San Diego police officers. But since uh, last July, 100 police officers, I understand, have left the force here in San Diego. How does the new contract address retention and recruitment? It was incredibly important. And, you know, the council did uh, a great work on, on improving that yesterday. And it was, a, it was a joint effort. I mean, it was Mayor, Council, Police Officers Association. Hugely important to making sure that when we hire the best and brightest men and women that they stay in our department. We had, as you rightfully pointed out, uh, folks leaving to go to other jurisdictions because we were not competitive. This changes that. 
This makes us not only competitive uh, for right now, but for the foreseeable future. And the bottom line is that means that we have more men and women making our neighborhoods safer. Um, that is, was a huge priority for me when I stepped in as mayor. And so it was a lot of work that got us to that point yesterday, but I was very gratified, and I think uh, San Diego should be as well. Well, something else, of course, that happened with the police department was that recent federal probe that linked a, a lapse in supervision to That's 17 right. cases of misconduct. U.S. Attorney Laura Duffy says reforms are underway. Are you involved in those reforms? Uh, we are, uh, incredibly so. And, in fact, I think one of the good things that came out of that report, which I supported uh, 100%, that the department was already moving forward on the vast majority of the recommendations. Not surprising because I think our chief, our police chief, Shelley Zimmerman, is doing a remarkable job. One of the things the report pointed out, you know, back to supervision issues, is that the city was not doing enough, a good enough job on making sure that rather than acting sergeants, that we had permanent sergeants. That was a reflection of some of the issues that we had with folks leaving for other departments. We're changing that. And I think that that's one of the, one, frankly, one of the good news findings and really why yesterday's action by the council was so important in the work that we're doing with our police department on this really land-breaking five-year agreement. Uh, another agreement. Uh, today, the city council took up the issue of a permanent homeless facility. Yeah. Uh, who would operate that facility and how would it be funded? You know, St. Vincent's de Paul and funding from dollars that we were already putting together for our temporary uh, winter shelter tents. And what we're saying is, let's not just have a temporary tent downtown. Let's have an operation that we can help folks get the help that they need, you know, 12 months out of the year, 365 days. And that's, I think, one of the things that I'm really excited about. Um, and it's not just about a bed. It's about the supportive services, whether that be counseling, mental health, medical, that really help somebody get back on their feet, make the transition out, you know, from being homeless. Uh, so I think this is a this is going to be uh, really important for the city and something that, as mayor and the council, we are strongly committed to. Now we'll have to end on this, but you were in Sacramento yesterday yeah. uh, for a climate change panel. How does San Diego's climate change plan compare to what other cities are doing here in California? Well, I, I was really proud of what we're doing in San Diego, and I, I want to share that on a, on a statewide basis at the panel. I mean, we're, we're really we're having a, a, a significant plan that addresses the, the climate change uh, issues head on, makes it you know ties it to our general plan so it's enforceable. Has goals that are you know stretch goals, but ones that I know we can achieve. You know, 100% renewable energy by 2035. It won't be easy, but, you know, our clean air, our water, it's part of our DNA as to who we are as San Diegans. And I think it's incredibly important for our city as we move forward that we have a plan that's going to work, that's really fostering new technologies in the clean tech sector. So that's what I was talking about in Sacramento. It's pretty well received. All right. San Diego Mayor Kevin yeah. Faulkner, thanks so much hey, for the great update. Great to see you. Thank you. On the political desk, our series continues on San Diego City Council members. Up next is Mark Kersey, a Republican who represents Rancho Pinasquito, Scripps Ranch, and Rancho Bernardo. KPBS reporter Claire Trageser shows us the kids who find out more about his job and the tough decisions he has to make. What we've got is three options, right? Three choices. You can do the recycling project, which we talked about. You could do the art display, or you could do the butterfly garden. There's a special visitor in Miss McCoy's second grade class at Willow Grove Elementary School in Poway. This is a hard choice because these are three good options, and this is oftentimes what happens when you vote. City Councilman Mark Kersey is there teaching the students about voting. So we're going to vote just like your parents do, and Gina, is, Ms. Mrs. Jacobs, is passing around the ballots. The students get to vote on what project to build. Some have grimmer reasoning than others. What about Grant? What do you think? You'll just be keeping the butterflies in a cramped space, and soon enough, the plants will die, then the butterflies will die, uh -huh. and you'll just have a dead garden in the middle of your school. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> the students wait anxiously as the ballots are counted. The cycling has got a commanding lead, I think. No. 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 Yes. Yes. Recycling ends up the winner, leaving butterfly supporters licking their wounds. Don't like wine. That's right. Because, because it's just like a game. 
That's right. There's no crying in democracy. I like that. Ainsley, what do you think? Kersey says just like the butterfly fans, he hasn't always gotten his way on the city council. For example, when he opposed raising the minimum wage. And certainly the, the minimum wage issue, I think I took, I don't know, five or six votes on that and, uh, and came up short every time. But yeah, that's how the process works, and it's, uh, it's okay. Just like we told the kids, just because you vote for the, the one that doesn't win doesn't mean you're wrong, doesn't mean it's bad. It's just uh, other people wanted the other one. Kersey was first introduced to politics in high school when his stepfather was elected mayor of their small town near Columbus, Ohio. So it was, you know, one of these things where everybody knows everybody. And I think at that level, it's more like running for high school student council than anything. It's just a popularity contest. Nice to see you. Good to see you, too. Hey, welcome. Almost 14 years ago, he moved to San Diego for a job. Then two years later, started his own telecom consulting firm. During his first term, Kersey shepherded through council an open data ordinance, which will put more public data from city departments online. Open data is really something that gives a lot more tools to average citizens to, to small businesses to be able to access their government and to really understand uh, you know, different data points about what's going on in the community. Seven inches uh, severity, so under anything. Now Kersey is turning his focus to the funding gap for fixing the city's roads, sidewalks, and other infrastructure. So for a, a period of time, and a number of years, the city essentially stopped investing in infrastructure and we just weren't doing basic things like maintenance and repair of all the things that we own. And as a result, we've gotten to the point where, uh, you know, it's just like if you don't change the oil in your car for years and years, well, eventually your car is just going to be shot, right? And you're not going to be able to just catch up and suddenly start making all your oil changes. Well, now you either need a new engine or potentially need a brand new car. He's head of the council's infrastructure committee. Uh, very happy to see these sidewalk assessments finally getting underway. And is working on a ballot measure that would raise more money for repairs. It's got to solve the actual problem. And it's got to be something that people are actually going to want to support. And so what we're going to do is, is spend the balance of this year is figuring out what is the right kind of bucket of things that we could put together that is going to accomplish those two goals. Any closing thoughts before we wrap up? Back in Miss McCoy's classroom, the yeah. debate over butterflies and recycling is finished. And Kersey is fielding other questions about his work. Brad, one more thought? No? You're going to pass? Okay. How hard is you know? Well, I mean, we have to make tough decisions just like this, right? So that, that can be kind of difficult. But some people actually work really hard for a living, right? Like people digging ditches or, you know, have to spend all day out in the sunshine getting all hot and sweaty. Or, you know, people who have to, you know, fix toilets for a living, let's say, for example, right? I mean, doesn't fixing toilets sound like an actual hard job? Yeah. Yeah, right? Would you want to do that? No. Not really? So yes, my job, making these choices can be tough, but there are plenty of people who have much tougher jobs than me. Claire Tregesser, KPBS News. Former State Supreme Court Justice Cruz Reynoso talks with Peggy Pico about the role of Latinos in a changing America. He was born into a farm working family, worked with the labor leader Cesar Chavez as a community organizer in Imperial County, and went on to become the first Latino on the California Supreme Court. And among other honors is the recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Former California Supreme Court Justice Cruz Reynoso, welcome to Evening Edition. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Now, the Cesar Chavez holiday is just a few days away. What do you remember most about working? On, uh, on those projects that you worked with him? Well, I started working with him when he was the staff member of the, Cal of the CSO, Community Service Organization. I belonged to that organization in El Centro, California, in Imperial County. Uh, so we dealt with, with, with all kinds of issues, from citizenship issues to uh, actually um, find, uh, getting the, the legislature to pass a, a uh, bill that gave uh, the folk who did not have Social Security a small pension because farm workers did not have pensions. Uh, so, so we worked on many different projects. And then later he started, he started uh, organizing farm workers on a full-time basis, and I had contact with him there, though I wasn't part of that Sure, you guys, you guys kind of took separate paths on that, but working to protect uh, farm workers' rights. What do you see as the biggest civil rights issue in the United States right now? The biggest civil rights issue in the United States right now is the great difference of income with, the, uh, uh, with those at the top earning many, many more times than those at the bottom. A, um, a Supreme Court justice once said 
that you can have most of the assets go to a few persons, or you can have democracy, but you can't have both. And I think that's true. I think we need an element of economic democracy to have a real political democracy. So I think that's really the most serious issue in America right now. That, I think that would surprise people as a civil rights issue, but you are tonight giving a talk at the downtown library titled The Role of Latinos in Changing America. What roles do you see Latinos play uh, specifically, do you think they will play in the upcoming 2016 election? I think the Latinos now being 38% of the population in California have a very serious responsibility to assure that Calif that that uh, that the United States, um, which will be like California ethnically and racially in 20, 30, 40 years, uh, uh, has that experiment be a success in California so that we, despite uh, difference uh, of ethnicity, race, uh, religion, and so on, have a common notion of what we would like California to be and the United States to be. And so I think that, that Latinos have a very uh, strong responsibility in that, that regard socially and politically. It's not just political, but socially also. Uh, on that note, uh, many Latino voters seem to be called or seem to remain a sleeping giant here in California. Why do you think that is? Well, there, there's several reasons. Uh, w one is that the Latino population is considerably younger than, than other groups in California. So, so, so some are not old enough to vote yet. Uh, then secondly, m m quite a few of them are not citizens, so they can't vote. But beyond that, uh, uh, all, all studies indicate that those who are poorer have less so social interaction than those who are rich, and that includes voting. So, and that's in respect of, incidentally, of race or, or, or ethnicity. And sad to say, the Latino community right now is the poorest community in California. Governor Jerry Brown appointed you to the California Supreme Court back in 1981. You were the first Latino, again, on the court. But five years later, you and two other justices were recalled over uh, death penalty rulings. How did that affect you? Uh, you know, I'm not sure that it was just about the death penalty. That was, that was the political issue that, that the new governor, Duke Majan, used. And it was the issue that the anti uh, tax people, the Howard Jarvis pe people used. In fact, I think they were unhappy with the way the California Supreme Court had been ruling for at least 50 years at a time when it was considered the most prestigious state Supreme Court in, in, in the nation. And I think they wanted, they wanted to change it. So, so they saw that since, since it was going, their polls indicate the campaign against Rose Byrd, Chief Justice Rose Byrd, who was the first woman to, 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 be, to be appointed, was going well. They figured they might as well try to take over the court, which they succeeded. I hope the reality that they went after the first woman, the first Chicano, and a Jewish member was not the reason they went against us. I think it's really that they thought that we were the most politically vulnerable. Uh, and, and, and they were right. Uh, but I must say that I'm still proud of the work that we did on the Supreme Court and the tradition that the Supreme Court had always had at that time. And you're 84 years old and still teaching at UC Davis. Well, I'll be, I'll, I'll be 84 in just, just a month or two. Great. So I'm, I'm, I'm aging you here. Well, former California Supreme Court Justice Cruz Reynoso, thank you so much for joining us. And I want to let folks know that they can hear Justice Reynoso's speech, The Role of Latinos in a Changing America, tonight at 7 at the San Diego Central Library in downtown. Admission is free. For details, go to kpbs.org. I'm Gwen Eiffel. On the next News Hour, we talk to Afghan President Ashraf Ghani on the way forward for his war weary country. That's Tuesday on the PBS News Hour. Just a day old and already swimming around, this baby hippopotamus is the newest member of the San Diego Zoo family, born early Monday morning. We don't know if she's a boy or a girl yet. Her mom, Funani, is 30 years old. She has given birth 11 times, seven of them right here in San Diego. Only 10% of heart transplants performed in the U.S. are done on children. So to have twin brothers receive new hearts within two months of each other is truly a miracle for 11-year-old Raul and Eric Montano of San Diego. I just want to say thank you to the doctors 
for everything that they did for us. <laughs> They're just so amazing. These fraternal twins born two minutes apart have a genetic heart condition in their family. Raul is the oldest. I'm feeling with more energy than I used to. It cost an estimated $1 million for each operation, paid for by donor money, to Rady's Children's Hospital. Talk about rare, even the boy's eight-year-old cousin recently got a new heart. All of us has it. Um, some of us is not that complicated like our kids, but it, it runs in the family. And we're so thankful that our, my nephew just got it done last week, and he's doing great, too. His recovery is amazing. The United Network for Organ Sharing estimates about 3,000 people are on the wait list for a new heart at any given time but only 10% of these operations are done on children. To have everything come together, uh, to have a team approach to this, to be able to perform this consistently and reliably is a special thing, and it's, not, it's new to our, to our program, new to our city. It's unprecedented. Five heart transplants in nine to 10 weeks here at Rady's Hospital. This is the final piece of the puzzle to being able to say to the community, we can offer A to Z pediatric cardiac care from the first operation as a newborn baby to end stage heart failure in a teenager, and we can now do it all, and that's a good feeling. The road ahead for transplant recipients is not an easy one. They must take anti-rejection medication for the rest of their lives. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks so much for joining us. You have a great night.